Mary Tudor, otherwise known as Mary I, was the first female monarch in England to rule in her own right, and at the start of her reign, she was a popular and much-loved member of the royal family. Everything seemed set to go well to usher in a new age. So what changed? Why did she come to be known as Bloody Mary? And did she even deserve the name? Mary was born in Greenwich at the Palace of Placentia on the 18th of February 1516. She was not the first child her mother, Catherine of Aragon, had given birth to, but she would be the first to survive beyond infancy. Her father, Henry VIII, had been hoping for a boy, but a healthy royal child was still a blessing. For seven long years, her mother had endured four miscarriages, a stillbirth, and a baby son who had died at two months old. She must have felt the pressure of both Henry VIII's expectations and the country's. Mary was baptised into the Catholic faith that would come to dominate so much about her and her later reign just three days after she was born. Any disappointment Henry felt at his child being a girl was smoothed over by his belief that he would yet be able to have a son. While we cannot know what Catherine really felt, the fact that her seventh child was also the first to survive probably meant she didn't feel as confident as Henry about the chances of having a son to follow Mary. In other words, Catherine always saw Mary as the heir to England's throne. However, although Mary was always a much-loved child, she was, as was the case with most royal children, not brought up alongside her parents. Her household would have been her close family, and foremost of these was the Countess of Salisbury, Margaret Pole, who in May 1520 took on the role of Lady Governess. She would become the greatest influence on Mary in her formative years. Margaret was not only a close friend of Catherine of Aragon, but she knew court etiquette back to front, and her character was impeccable. In short, she was a perfect example to bring up an English princess. Mary was, like her younger sister Elizabeth, a gifted child. Despite the myth that she lived a dour and fervently religious upbringing as a child, she actually enjoyed the frivolity of plays and masks, and a significant portion of her household budget was spent on these for the Christmas festivities. She also loved music, and at just four years old, she wowed a group of visiting French gentlemen, sent by Francis I to report back on the then-future bride of his son, with a recital on the virginals, a version of a harpsichord. As her childhood years went by, Mary would learn to read and write Latin, as well as studying French and her mother's native tongue, Spanish. And although her father Henry was impressed with his daughter's skill and taste, it was as an eligible bride he took the most interest. Royal princesses were political tools, and Henry ensured he took full advantage at the earliest possible moment. At two and a half, Mary was betrothed to the Dauphin of France, although she was not expected to be in France until she was around 14. It's also unlikely Henry ever really imagined his daughter marrying Francis I's son, also named Francis, but it served the interests of England to attempt to bring peace however temporary, through a contract of marriage. After just three years, the contract would be called off, and Mary would instead be promised to Charles V of Spain, her cousin who was 22 years her senior. But it was a happy occasion, and he was greeted warmly by Londoners when he visited for the only time to meet his young bride-to-be. It was also the only time Mary met her cousin Charles, but she always remembered him fondly as a kind father figure. But, as with the Dauphin, this marriage was called off after a few years, but this time with the mutual arrangement of Charles V. 
This was a pattern that would dominate Mary's life through her childhood, teen years and adulthood. While it was normal for a royal daughter to be used in this way as a political pawn, Mary had so many suitors, it cannot have been possible for her to have remembered half of them. Each time she was recalled to court by her father, it was likely she would be introduced to the next possible husband she would never marry. But it was also around this time that Henry seems to have accepted, as Catherine had so much earlier, that Mary was likely to be his only heir. In the contract negotiations for the marriage between his young daughter and Charles V, his nephew-in-law, Henry remarks that the fact she was his sole heir meant he expected a large sum from the Holy Roman Emperor in exchange for her hand. In 1525, when Mary was nine years old, she was sent to reside in the Welsh marches, but this was not a full transfer of power as it might be for a Prince of Wales. She was given her own council at Ludlow Castle. The reason given for her presence was that in the absence of any Prince of Wales living there or in the marches, the administration of justice had suffered, but her position was nebulous and although she was addressed by her courtiers as the Princess of Wales, she was never formally invested as such. As Mary grew into a young woman, reports of her were often complimentary. Described as having a charming personality, more outgoing than her mother, but less boisterous than her father, and was well liked at her appearances at court. Her servants loved her dearly, and she would often look after them with lifelong support. She also loved her parents, once writing to Cardinal Wolsey in 1528 to thank him in aiding her to see them for a month and being in their company. In short, Mary was seen as a charming young woman who was well loved by those who knew her. But as Mary progressed into her elder teens, it was not the issue of her marriage that took centre stage, but that of her parents. Mary had been shielded for a long time from the difficulties of her parents' strained marriage, and so was unprepared at the age of 15 when she had to accept the reality of what was about to happen. Everything had really started in 1522, when Anne Boleyn entered the English court, fresh from France. She was very different to the other ladies of the court, and after a few years, she would finally catch the eye of Henry. Some hated Anne, seeing her as nothing more than a royal concubine who had separated a father and a daughter, broken up a marriage, and most unforgivably, severed England from Rome's influence. Others saw in Anne Boleyn a well-educated woman who cared deeply about religion and the poor, Mary would become her mortal enemy. But this was not merely a personal hatred for breaking up her parents' marriage, it ran far deeper than that. Through the influence of Anne at Henry's side, Mary saw even less of her father than before, was separated from her mother even when she was ill, and lost her title of princess being demoted to Lady Mary. Her physical and emotional well-being was shattered by the event of her parents' divorce, and she would only ever speak of Anne as that woman. It's not hard to imagine the experience would harden her against several things, the Protestant religion, the Boleyn family, and the idea that her parents' marriage was invalid. But the truth was, that Henry had planned to divorce himself from Catherine of Aragon long before he cast his gaze over Anne Boleyn. If it hadn't been her, it would have been someone else. In her mind, watching her mother continue on as normal at public functions with her father, Mary came to the conclusion, as Catherine did, that conscience was the main reason behind Henry's decision to separate. He based the need to divorce Catherine on the basis that she had been his brother's wife, although she always maintained she had never consummated the marriage with Prince Arthur. Therefore, Mary learned an important lesson, that a clear conscience 
was the most important thing for yourself and your relationship with God. It was something that would cause her many problems in the future. To make things worse, although Mary had grown up in the luxurious trappings expected of a princess, she was now to have it all removed. Her household was dissolved, and her servants were dismissed, including the Countess of Salisbury, Margaret Pole, the most steadfast influence in her life since birth. Mary was moved to her half-sister's new household at Hatfield House. It must have felt as though the world had turned upside down. Although Mary found common ground with her half-sister while younger, she refused to acknowledge her as a princess or her mother as a queen. It no doubt influenced how she treated Elizabeth in later years. Her father was angered by her refusal, and their relationship became strained over the next four years. But 1536, when Mary was 20 years old, was to be a dramatic year. On the 7th of January, her mother Catherine died. Her health had faltered for some time, and the cause of her death was thought to be that of a heart condition. One of Catherine's final acts was to write a letter to her husband Henry, beseeching him to think of his immortal soul before worldly cares, and above all, to be a good father to their daughter Mary. It was a touching and heartfelt letter, but Henry would take little heed of it. Mary, for her part, was devastated. She wasn't permitted to be with her mother when she was dying, and so she was never given a chance to say goodbye to her. No doubt, this would have left its mark on her once joyful personality. Mary had gone from being a loved and doted on princess to becoming a cast-aside illegitimate daughter of the king, and now she had lost her mother without having the chance to see her again. Just a few months later, finally having tired of waiting for a son and arguing with Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII and Thomas Cromwell came up with one of the most infamous plots in Tudor history. Discrediting his wife with accusations of adultery, incest, and even of having tried to poison Catherine of Aragon and Mary, Henry had Anne shut up in the Tower of London. There, she fell into a hysterical state, rambling for hours and giving Cromwell all the supposed evidence he required to cement the sentence for what was, most likely, an innocent woman in regards to the charges against her. On the 19th of May that year, she was sent to the scaffold and beheaded. There is little evidence of Mary's immediate reaction to the news, but it must have felt something of a triumph that that woman was gone, and no doubt the princess assumed she would automatically be restored to her former place. She waited a week with no news, writing to Cromwell and asking him to be a conduit between herself and Henry, no doubt confused as she allowed her naivety to allow her to believe the best of her father. Henry was unyielding in his desire for Mary to bend to his will and accept him as head of the church. She agreed to submit to his authority as far as God and her conscience would allow her to. It wasn't enough, and on the 22nd of June, 1536, she was forced to sign a document that not only accepted her father's authority as her sovereign and head of the church, but also stated that her parents' marriage was unlawful and incestuous. It must have been a traumatic decision to make. Mary knew there was no chance of reconciliation to her previous position without signing it, and there were few people fighting in her corner now but it taught Mary a valuable lesson that she would later put into play during her own time as a ruler. You could force people to bend to your will if you were in charge, if you thought it was in their best interests, and that people did not always know what was best for them. Only the monarch could know that. It also probably hardened her further against the Church of England. 
It left its shadow on her conscience for the rest of her life. Everything she had stood for had been relinquished in her very human desire for acceptance by her father and a peaceful life. Mary was welcomed back to court, but it wasn't quite as it had been before. Like Elizabeth, Mary was still considered illegitimate, although they were later restored to the line of succession in 1544. A few proposals came forward for Mary's hand, but they came to nothing. In 1541, Mary suffered yet more loss when her father had Margaret Pole beheaded for her supposed part in a Catholic plot in which her son, Reginald Pole, was implicated. To make the loss more horrific, Margaret's execution was the stuff of nightmares, as the young and inexperienced executioner missed her neck, hacking her head and shoulders to pieces. By this point, Mary must have felt numb from grief. Margaret Pole herself had been nothing but loyal, and had been a secondary mother for Mary. She deserved better than the terrible death she received. Not surprisingly, the young princess fell ill once again. Henry VIII died in 1547. Whatever Mary did publicly, she must have privately felt relief. Despite being her father, Henry had not acted like one for much of her life, and finally, he could have no control over it. She was left a wealthy and independent woman with her own estates, but the role she had been prepared for as a little girl, that of England's monarch, was passed over to her brother Edward. While she lived in an era where women were a subspecies to men, and no one had ever really bothered to define what the role of a female regnant would be, Mary must have still mulled over the question in her mind of how she would have ruled. As it was, Edward and Mary frequently butted heads over her choice of religion. King Edward VI, as he was now known, had only ever known life with the Protestant religion his father had created. Mary, by contrast, refused to relinquish her Catholic faith and continued to unlawfully hold mass in her own home. When Edward angrily responded to this by demanding she stop, Mary wrote to her cousin Charles V to apply international pressure to allow her to continue. For much of her brother's reign, Mary stayed away from court, living on her own estates. On one of the few occasions where she went to court at Christmas 1550, Mary was reduced to tears and embarrassed before the courtiers when Edward used the occasion to admonish her for not capitulating to his demands, but still she refused to do as he commanded. On the 6th of July 1553, after an illness that may have been tuberculosis, Edward VI died at the age of just 15. Mary must have been waiting for her moment, but sadly, it didn't come. Aware that Mary would attempt to reverse the religious reforms put in place by his father and himself, Edward excluded her from succession to the throne. Instead, naming Lady Jane Grey and her sisters as his successors. But the princess was sharper than her brother had expected, and although she had been asked to come to London to visit Edward before he died, Mary caught wind of rumours that it was a trap, and instead fled to her estates in East Anglia. Here, she didn't just have wealth, but men ready to fight for her. Many Catholic subjects still lived in the areas that were Mary's strongholds, and she was still a popular and well-liked princess. On the 12th of July, just two days after Jane had been proclaimed queen by the Duke of Northumberland, Mary assembled her forces at Framlingham Castle, where she had made her base. Support for Northumberland and Jane's reign crumbled away, and the Privy Council declared in Mary's favour on the 19th of July, deposing Jane. It was a triumph for Mary, and one she had done in her own right, 
using nothing but her popularity amongst the people and her sense of regal authority. She knew something important that her sister Elizabeth also understood later, that no monarch could hold the throne of England without the common consent of its people. On the 3rd of August, Mary rode triumphantly into London with her half-sister Elizabeth by her side. It was a calculated show of a united front. The correct line to the throne had been restored and now all would be well, but it was something of a sham. Elizabeth and Mary were not close, and Mary was suspicious of her sister due to her Protestant leanings. But once Mary was crowned as Queen on the 1st of October, she lost no time in starting her new regime in the manner everyone had expected. She released two important men from the Tower of London that would aid her rule. Thomas Howard, who would serve in her Privy Council, and Stephen Gardner, who would become her Lord Chancellor. Both were deeply Catholic. It was obvious from the start Mary was going to attempt to restore the Catholic faith to England. While she has often been seen as a fanatic, it must be understood that she saw herself as saving the souls of her kingdom. She wasn't alone in her thinking. However, Mary initially issued a proclamation that she would not force her subjects to follow Catholicism. After all, Many of them had been born into Protestantism as her brother had, and it was all they had ever known. She understood that making someone agree to something on paper did not mean they would follow it in their heart. She had first-hand understanding of this. With the document she had been forced to sign, stating her father was head of the church. At the same time, by September of that year, Many leading Protestant church leaders had been put into the Tower of London. Laws were passed declaring her parents' marriage valid and repealing all of the religious laws Edward had passed. Church doctrine was returned to the form it had held before the break with Rome and Parliament would later be convinced to repeal Henry VIII's religious laws as well. It was clear Mary felt she was restoring the country to the right path and was given the epithet, Defender of the Faith. But Mary won over her subjects by immediately also implementing various measures to save the economy. Coinage under her father and brother had become much adulterated and the issue of new gold and silver coins bearing her images had an immediate effect of lowering the cost of goods by a third. Mary also used her own significant wealth to repay the debts of both her father and brother, which increased goodwill towards her. In short, the public, who had not known what to expect from their much-loved princess, now looked forward to a prosperous and stable government under their new queen. But Mary also had her forgiving side. She understood that the main instigator of the plot to place Jane Grey on the throne was not Jane herself, but the Duke of Northumberland, and he was summarily executed. But Jane she attempted to save, sending priests to talk Jane into converting to Catholicism and accepting Mary as her queen. But Jane clung as stubbornly to her faith as Mary did to her own, refusing to recant her Protestantism. Even when Mary's advisers told Mary she needed to commit to getting rid of Jane, the new queen refused to accept the idea. Frances Brandon, Jane's mother, had been a close cousin and friend of hers when they were teenagers, and she had already forgiven Jane's father on the basis of this kinship. But unfortunately, when word of her possible marriage to the Catholic Philip of Spain reached the nobles, a number of them rose up in what came to be known as Wyatt's Rebellion. After the rebellion was put down, Mary was left with little choice but to rid herself of Jane, as Jane's father, Henry Grey, had been involved. 
She only gave in and agreed to Jane's execution, as well as that of her young husband, Guilford Dudley, after exhausting all possible avenues, and Mary only did so reluctantly, under pressure from her advisers. No doubt it weighed heavily on her mind, as she later did what she could to return the fortunes of Francis, her cousin, and her two remaining daughters. Mary's other immediate concern was that of producing an heir. She was by now 37 years old, and the idea of not marrying would simply not have crossed Mary's mind. Her grandmother, Isabella of Castile, had never questioned her own ability to rule as a queen, but she would never have considered doing it alone. The religion Isabella deeply impressed on her family enforced that it was even a regal woman's duty to marry and bear children, and this was passed down to her daughter Catherine, who in turn passed it on to Mary. She reinforced this idea by her devotion to Henry VIII, always maintaining she was his wife even after their divorce. So when Mary's chance came, especially after so many years waiting, she would have seen marriage as much her duty as ruling her country. Her cousin Charles V suggested his only legitimate son, Philip of Spain, as her husband. Marriage negotiations began, and Philip's portrait was sent to Mary, who apparently fell in love with him at first sight upon viewing it. However, the marriage proposal was not popular with many members of her council, who unsuccessfully tried to convince Mary to marry an Englishman. Mary was the first undisputed Queen Regnant in English history, after the disputed and short reigns of Empress Matilda and Jane Grey, and there was no precedent to how to handle her marriage. When most queens married, their lands and possessions became their husbands. It was feared that England would become just another part of the Habsburg Empire. To counter this, in the aftermath of Wyatt's rebellion, Mary had a contract drawn up that stated that although Philip would be called King of England, military support could not be given to his father, Philip could not act without his wife's consent, and a parliament could only be called by both of them, but only during Mary's lifetime. It also stated that they would have control over their own respective realms, as her maternal grandparents had done. Philip was apparently unhappy with these terms, but the marriage would bring political and strategic gains to Spain, as well as preserving the Catholic faith on both sides of the English Channel. He didn't find Mary attractive, but the marriage went ahead on the 25th of July 1554 at Winchester Cathedral, just two days after they first met. In September, Mary thought that finally she had secured the throne for her bloodline, as her body began to show signs of being pregnant. She stopped menstruating and began to feel nausea in the mornings. Her physicians thought she was pregnant too. In April 1555, Elizabeth was released from her house arrest at Woodstock to witness the birth of her new niece or nephew. She had been placed at Woodstock as Protestant plots to remove Mary and place Elizabeth on the throne were revealed, although Elizabeth's part in them had not been confirmed. Mary had become more suspicious of her sister over the years, and this was mostly down to religion. Mary herself had defied her brother's commands to conform to his religious laws, and so she knew it was possible for Elizabeth to secretly be planning to reverse everything again. However, two more months passed, and no child appeared. Mary's abdomen receded, and it seems likely the whole event had been a false pregnancy. This was most likely brought on by Mary's desire to have a child and secure her own bloodline for the throne. The stress of finding out she was exactly where she had been before, her embarrassment at not being pregnant, and her heartbreak at not being a mother, must have taken its toll. To make matters worse, 
Philip had to leave shortly afterwards to command his armies in the Low Countries, also embarrassed by the whole event. Mary held her composure as they said goodbye, but broke down in tears privately shortly after his departure. It was the sign of a woman broken down by the weight put upon her shoulders. In December 1554, Mary wrote a brief statement to her council, summing up her feelings on the religion of the realm. Within it, she stated how she wanted to see that all universities and churches were following the rules of Catholicism, and that those who were heretics should be punished. She also stated, I would wish none to be burnt without some of the council's presence and, both there and everywhere, good sermons at the same. It is for this punishment Mary became infamous, for burning around 300 Protestants. But what is often forgotten for context is that in Mary's time, few would have raised their brows at the idea of heretics being burned at the stake either Protestant or Catholic. It had been an established punishment for heresy for centuries. However, while many of Mary's qualities can be redemptive, this was state-prescribed murder. But this was no different to the rest of her family. Her father was responsible for as many as up to 72,000 executions during his reign. Elizabeth, in her later reign, would execute around 450 people in an uprising against her in the north, and she put 130 priests to death simply for being Catholic. In other words, while Mary's choice of punishing heretics in this way was horrific, it was no different to other rulers before or after her. Her own brother's short reign had also featured burning of Catholic leaders. Burning at the stake was a popular choice for heresy, as it was believed it gave heretics a taste of the hellfire if they didn't recant. What differed was the need in Elizabeth's reign to discredit Mary and the Catholic religion, and promote the virtues of Elizabeth tolerating both Catholicism and Protestantism. The numbers were played up or down as needed. However, even if Mary's decision is taken in the context of her time, at least one punishment was especially cruel, that of Thomas Cranmer. He was forced to watch Bishops Ridley and Latimer burning at the stake from his view in a tower near the Bocardo prison in Oxford, where he was imprisoned. The sight was enough to make him recant the Protestant faith and reconcile with Catholicism. Normally, this was enough for the monarch to forgive and release, but in Cranmer's case, this didn't happen. He had been imprisoned for two years, and in that time there had been several switches back and forth between the two religions, and it was obvious he would likely escape to Protestant-controlled Europe if he were freed, possibly to work against Mary. She was determined to make an example of him, and pressed ahead with his execution anyway. On the 21st of March, 1556, Thomas Cranmer spoke to the crowd before he was to be burned, but unexpectedly went off script, once again renouncing Catholicism and becoming a martyr to the Protestant cause. Cases like this would harden Protestants further against Mary, while she may have believed it was necessary to kill a few people in order to save the souls of many, it was not undoubtedly a cruel move to refuse to pardon where she could. It seemed her few years of queenship had changed Mary from someone who was willing to try and save even someone who had usurped her throne, to one who did whatever she had to in order to keep her throne. The burnings were hugely unpopular, and gave way not just to anti-Catholic feeling, but anti-Spanish feeling in turn. The victims were held up as martyrs, and Mary was warned that if she continued with the policy, it could cause a revolt. So why did she continue? It can't have simply been the thought of saving the souls of her kingdom. 
Although Mary had once been a tolerant and gentle person, keeping her throne was now her priority. With no heir, Mary would have quickly realised what was going to happen. Elizabeth was still her heir in the case of her death, and it was obvious that the princess preferred the Protestant faith. Philip finally returned to visit his wife in March 1557 to persuade Mary to aid him in a war against France. Nothing came of this until June, however, when Reginald Pole's nephew, Thomas Stafford, invaded England as part of a plot to depose Mary. It was unsuccessful, but war was declared, and England's husbands and sons went to fight in a Spanish war. It was a hugely unpopular move, and did nothing to help Mary's image. This wasn't helped by a series of wet harvests that occurred during her five-year reign, which led to famine. And although Mary was married to the ruler of Spain, Spanish merchants jealously guarded their trade routes and refused to share them. And Mary could not, as Elizabeth later did, advocate piracy against Spanish ships, as she was married to Philip II. But another event happened with Philip's visit. Mary, once again, was convinced she was pregnant. The due date for the baby, March 1558, came and went, and no child was born. But this time, there was no embarrassment as there had been the first time. In fact, there was hardly any flicker of notice given at all. Mary was forced to accept that Elizabeth would succeed her throne. From the end of that summer, Mary fell ill. She took to her apartments and was stricken with fevers and weakness. At the end of October, she added to her will that she understood her sister would be queen. She had attempted to evade Elizabeth's grasp on the throne, but Mary knew she was dying, and it was more important for England to have a stable and rightful ruler. On the 17th of November, possibly from uterine cancer, ovarian cysts, or influenza, Mary I, England's first undisputed female ruler, died. She left a tangled legacy. In her youth, she had been a precocious and lovable child who had delighted everyone who met her, impressing them with her gentle and joyful nature. But her father's decision to divorce her mother and cast Mary aside had killed some of that in her, and Mary was hardened against aspects of the kingdom she later came to rule. Her devotedness to Catholicism and her certainty that it was the right path for England would lead her to burn over 300 people for heresy, and her forgiving nature was pushed to the limit by her desire to prevent her Protestant sister from claiming her throne. But she was really no better or worse than her siblings or father. She is often compared to Elizabeth's long and fruitful reign, but in reality it is unfair to do so, as Mary's reign was much shorter and plagued by events out of her control such as the overly wet harvests. Her punishments for heretics were horrific, but not out of context for the time she lived in, and the numbers killed were little different to those of her siblings, and far less than her father. Mary I made mistakes, but as the first Queen Regnant of England, perhaps she could be forgiven for trying to figure out her role. Elizabeth did a much better job of negotiating balance with her council and advisers, but she had the advantage of having watched Mary's mistakes and gains and learning from them. So while Mary is known to history as bloody, thanks mostly to the effective propaganda from Protestants in Elizabeth's time, she was much more complex than that in reality. She was a much-loved princess who became hardened due to her youth and then went on to become a determined queen who wanted to do the best by her country and God. She should instead perhaps be remembered as a woman scared for her position. <laughs>
steadfast in her beliefs, and desperate only to set her life back to a time when it felt better. In the end, Elizabeth and Mary, along with their brother Edward and the six wives of Henry VIII, were victims of their father's determination to have a son, a mindless policy that set in motion decades of religious dissent, misery and persecution. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any new documentaries.